on this edition of It's a Miracle. Return to the dark days of Hitler's final solution and the story of one Jewish family torn apart and destroyed by the Holocaust. Miraculously, two of the Hollander brothers would survive the horrors of the concentration camps, only to learn 48 years later that their lives were about to be blessed with another unexpected miracle. How can this be? Of course, I can't talk about it. It was such a shock that I don't even remember the words that he said, but whatever he said, it was a terrifying experience in my life. When a father learns that his three-year-old son is dying of congenital heart disease and that doctors in China can offer no hope, he turns to the internet. His desperate, heartfelt message sets the scene for a series of miraculous events halfway around the world. I kept thinking over and over, what if they were told the same thing that we were told? And it's not true. This child is really operable. Something can be done to help him, but they just need another opinion. These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight's show examines the power of the media, television, print, and the latest internet technologies. Now, we all know they exert a tremendous influence on our lives, bringing the world into our homes and keeping us up to date on all the latest information. But once in a while, their influence can be so profound that it's, well, miraculous. We've discovered several amazing stories that illustrate that power. After you've seen them, you may never turn on the TV, pick up a paper, or log online again without wondering if a miracle might be waiting there for you as well. We'll begin with a story that spans nearly 50 years and that would never have had an ending if it weren't for a popular daytime talk show right after this. Of all the forms of media, television is perhaps the most immediate and the most powerful. We turn to it for the latest in breaking news and weather. It shapes tastes and attitudes. And in today's politics, it can mean the difference between winning an election and losing one. But the story you're about to see reveals another power, the ability to turn tragedy into triumph. In the Nazi occupation of Europe during World War II, millions of Jews were transported to concentration camps as part of Hitler's final solution. Among them, seven members of the Hollander family of Ishava, Czechoslovakia. It was March of 1944 when they arrived at the most notorious death camp of them all, Auschwitz. When we got off the train, an SS officer would direct you to go either left or right. None of us knew at the time where we were going or what the left was better or the right was better. My mother went to the left and uh, my three little sisters. I guess my father had an idea what's happening, but he would never tell us. I ain't never saw my father cry. That's the first time he broke down. Ernest and Alex Hollander would never see their mother and three sisters again. Three days later, they were transported to the slave labor camp, Allenbush. We were building a train station and carrying 50 pound bags of cement for 12 to 14 hours, practically without food. In the morning, they gave us a cup of coffee. There wasn't even coffee, it was just something that looked black, 
and tasted hot. And no food for the rest of the day until the end of the day, they would give us a quarter of a pound of bread and a bowl of potato peel soup. The German doctors figured out that you can survive on 600 calories anywhere from three to six months, because they figured if you die within three to six months, they have enough replacement people to replace us. Shortly after arriving at the camp, Ernest and Alex's father learned the terrible truth of what happened to his wife and daughters. That night, he broke the tragic news to his sons. They straight took him in into the showers. They told him it's showers, but it was the gas. They used um, uh, the cheapest gas that they were able to get, Cyclone B gas. It was so cheap that it didn't even kill the people. Some of them went in halfway there to the crematoriums. The one thing that kept them fighting to stay alive was the knowledge that their two older brothers had escaped the ghetto before the Nazis arrived. Perhaps one day they would be reunited. And then in April 1945, tragedy struck once again. My father's job at the camp was to cut railroad ties to size. Bovitz! Bovitz! He cut three of his fingers with an electric power saw. And in a concentration camp, if you cannot work, you cannot live. They threw him into a cell, starved him to death without any medical attention, without any medication, without even a bandage. The two brothers were now on their own. But somehow, they managed to endure 11 months of pain and suffering. One of the reasons we both survived, that we were together. My brother Ernest would encourage me to hold out another day, another hour. Fortunately, I was 15 years old. And when you are 15, you can probably endure a little more hardship than somebody that's 50 or 60 years old. In April 1945, as Allied forces began liberating the camps, Ernest and Alex were moved to an unknown destination. The Germans didn't want us to be liberated. Instead of putting us on trucks and transporting to another camp, they made us march. And it was called a death march. We were heading towards Dachau. Dachau is an extermination camp. We got liberated on the way to Dachau. And people said, you are free, you are free. I just couldn't understand that word free. The brothers had regained their freedom, but the happy reunion they'd hoped for with their older brothers was not meant to be. It would take nearly 50 years and a miracle for that to happen. The conclusion, when it's a miracle, returns. When Alex and Ernest Hollander were liberated at the end of World War II, their first thoughts were of reuniting with their two older brothers, who they hoped had escaped Nazi persecution. But they soon learned that, tragically, their brothers had been killed. And so, with little to keep them in Europe, they emigrated to the United States. It was here that they first encountered the revisionist thinking of hate groups who denounced the Holocaust as Jewish propaganda. Having personally experienced the horrors of the concentration camps, Ernest decided to dedicate his life to keeping the memory of what had happened alive. It was a decision that would be the start of a miracle. Kinderlach, today we're going to talk about a terrible, terrible time in our history. By 1992, Ernest was visiting 270 schools a year to tell his story. Millions of Jews, including myself, were put into horrible concentration camps where people were tortured. If not the survivors, who will tell the story? We have an obligation, and I tell that to the kids. You have an obligation to listen, and we have an obligation to tell you. 
because you are kids the next generation. You have to know firsthand that what happened. And this way you know how to, God forbid, if there's another Holocaust, how to stop it. And then in April of 1992, the Montel Williams Show hosted a debate on the Holocaust. Everyone around the world believes that the Holocaust took place. Why do you think it didn't? Well, Montel, it's very important to understand that... Among the panelists that day was Ernest Hollander. Well, let's, let's go back a little bit in history here. Ernest, could you take us back to that day in 1944 when your family arrived at Auschwitz? First of all, I'd like to make an opening statement. It would be an opportunity to reach an even larger audience with his story. But there was one man watching that day who recognized something in the story that no one else could see. His name was Zika, a Serbian immigrant who was unexpectedly home that day because his children's babysitter was unavailable. The first program he tuned into was the Montel Williams show. As he watched, he suddenly recognized one of the guests. The man speaking looked exactly like a man he knew in Serbia. And even stranger, they had the same last name. Jews couldn't get out in the street anymore regular. Zika immediately contacted his former neighbor, Hersche Hollander, and learned that he had a brother named Ernest, who he had believed to be dead for 48 years. I, I know you're, you're not getting phone numbers, but... This... Zika contacted the Montel Williams show to get Ernest's phone number. But at first, they didn't believe his story. However, Zika persisted. And finally, after several letters and phone calls, he was put in touch with Ernest's wife, Anna. Mrs. Hollander, um, my name is Zika, and I have something important to tell you. Hello, Bobola. And I came home, and my wife says to me, Ernie, I got great news for you. And I said, honey, if this is such a good news, why are you crying? And then she said, your brother is alive. Who told you such a thing? It's impossible that, that, we, that they, they saw him. We have a memorial plaque. I couldn't believe that because we had already many times people who said, I know your brother is alive. You give me $1,000, I give you your phone number and his address. I didn't this believe it. Hello? Yes, Zika, please. This is Zika. Zika, this is Ernst Hollander. Mr. Hollander, thank you so much for calling me. I saw you on TV and I think I know your brother who's in Serbia now. He's alive and I spoke to him on the phone. Do you want money from no, me? No, I don't no, understand, don't understand this. Understand. I... If you don't believe and me, he says to me, if you don't number. believe me, you call him up. And he gave me my brother's phone number. Hello. Is this, is this Hershey? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And I almost fainted. Yes, this is. Ernst Hollander. I just if, couldn't believe it. And then I started to ask him questions. Then I never spoke until... You know, to think of somebody that was not alive, suddenly here, 48 years later, that this person is alive. And after what happened to the rest of my family, it was not an easy thing to take. It was such a shock. 
that I don't even remember the words that he said, but whatever he said, it was a terrifying experience in my life. He's alive. He's alive. Meanwhile, Zika recontacted the Montel Williams show and explained what had happened. The producers decided to take the brothers' reunion a step farther. And in October 1992, after being separated for nearly 50 years, Ernest, Alex, and Hersha Hollander were reunited on national television. Please, let's welcome the missing piece to the Hollander family. He was brought out on stage, and I was in the front row. And when I saw him come up on that stage, I had my eyes full of tears. See the show. When he turned on the TV, it happened to be the Mantel show. Without Zika, there was no way I would have ever found out what happened to my brother. He had to contact the station a number of times before they believed that his story is true. But he was persistent and it paid off. There are so many miracles that happened one after the other. Till finally the main miracle came, my brother. We'll be right back. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. Our next story wasn't ripped from today's headlines. It was taken from the personal ads you see them in almost every newspaper. Single white female seeks, well, you fill in the blanks. I suppose that anyone who's answered one of those ads and found true love would consider it a miracle, but our next story has an even more miraculous element to it, a mysterious guardian angel. In January of 1992, 32-year-old Azriella Ackerman was looking for love in, apparently, all the wrong places. The biological clock was ticking so loud I couldn't sleep at night. I uh, was really starting to panic, actually. I'd been on, at that point, many, many, many bad dates. <laughs> I had tried the dating services and I had tried any number of things, so it was a feeling of, of great loneliness and my companion at that time was my dog. <laughs> Azriella decided to try one more thing, the personal ads, and chose a local Boston newspaper. The idea, of course, was if I'm going to find a nice Jewish boy, then why not run an ad in a Jewish paper, The Jewish Advocate? Single Jewish female, 32, warm-hearted. Ready for an equal partner to love. Azriella hoped that by placing her ad, she would find her beshert, the Jewish equivalent of a soulmate. Where would you like the replies sent to? The idea behind Beshert is that somewhere in the world is the other half of your soul, the other part of you, and that sometime in your life, if you're lucky, if you pay attention to the signs along the way, and if God graces you, then you find your other half. I placed three different ads over a period of several months, and during that period of time, I received, I would guess, about 100 different letters. 
and I went out on about 25 different dates. And the process went from one of real excitement to one of almost despair. <laughs> no, really, I had a great time. Okay, bye. By date number 20, 21, I started thinking he was never gonna be there. Hi, this is Azriella Ackerman. Completely yeah, discouraged, Azriella finally called the Jewish advocate yeah, and canceled her ad on the 4th of July, Independence Day. Two months later, Azriella was surprised to receive another response to her ad. Dear warm-hearted, God-centered soul, your personal and the September 4th advocate described someone that I would enjoy meeting. I was intrigued by the fact that the letter arrived so much later after the ad. And because I pay attention to kind of funny circumstances, I wondered how that was possible and what it meant. If you choose to get to know me, you'll find that I am warm. I read it and I thought, this seems like a very nice guy. Why not at least go on a date? So really within minutes of reading the letter, I picked up the phone and called him. And when she suggested that we get together later that evening, I was just thrilled because I was way too shy to go ahead and suggest that on my own. Azriella agreed to meet Stephen Jaffe for dinner at a nearby restaurant. I remember my first impression as though it were yesterday. I remember seeing her walk towards me and I went, is this my date? She's really nice. What did I do to deserve this? This is wonderful. Over dinner, Azriella asked Stephen why it had taken until September to answer the ad she'd placed months earlier. Stephen, why did you wait so long to write me a letter? No, I didn't wait long at all. But as soon as I saw your ad, I sent you a letter right away. Stephen explained that he was visiting an aunt over Labor Day weekend. He'd been recently divorced, and she encouraged him to start dating again. And then she handed him the latest edition of The Jewish Advocate. Just look, just look. All right, all right. There were a number of ads. This one caught my attention because it was seemed like it was written by somebody who was light and lively and was just the kind of person mm. that I'd like to meet. I've never answered a personal ad in my life, neither before nor since. Are you and sure it wasn't an old paper? No, no, I saw the date right away. He was real clear with that. He had seen it on Labor Day weekend. So the only thing that I could imagine was that they were having a slow weekend and they just shoved some old ads back in there. Their relationship progressed very quickly, and within weeks, there were even subtle hints about marriage. And so I got this idea that why don't I propose to him first? Because I knew he was on the shy side, I knew we were gonna get married anyway, and I thought, how romantic. And what better way for me to say to him, I'm here. As Riella invited Stephen over to her place for a romantic dinner. I tried to pretend that nothing was going on when he came in the door and we chit-chatted a little bit. And I knew his ritual. I knew that before I fed him dinner, I always went into my bathroom to wash his hands. Earlier that evening, Azriella had planned a special surprise for Stephen. I bought him an engagement ring and I put the ring in a box in the bathroom. And then I took a piece of soap and I drew a big heart and wrote the words, will you marry me, Stephen? And then before making him dinner, he went into the bathroom to wash his hands and I heard this scream. <laughs> I didn't have a moment's hesitation. In fact, I was thrilled that she asked me because that way I didn't have to go through all this turmoil inside and second guessing myself about when would be the right time to propose to her. We both decided that we really wanted to call the Jewish Advocate and thank them and let them know it works. <laughs> and now we're engaged. That is so exciting. Congratulations. And I said, and there's a question that I'm just dying to ask you. Why is it that my ad ran on Labor Day weekend when I canceled it on July 4th? And I remember her words exactly to this day. She paused and then she said, Now that is really funny because I specifically remember you calling me and telling me to rerun your ad on Labor Day. And I got chills through my whole body when she said that, and I paused, and then I said, it was my guardian angel who called you, because I certainly didn't. Stephen and Azriella were married on October 10th, 1993, just one year after they first met. And there was a feeling of awe that I was lucky enough to marry such a wonderful person. I just remember being awed to tears on 
that afternoon. I was so moved that all these circumstances had occurred for us to meet and that in this planet of a billion or so people that not, I mean it would have been an amazing story if I had met Stephen in The Jewish Advocate anyway. But the fact that I met him after the ad had been canceled, I felt so touched as if God had literally taken the time to just make sure that these two individuals clicked up. And I believe that God gave me meeting him in this extraordinary way because it's a share, it's meant to be. Yes. This year, as Rila and Stephen Jaffe will celebrate their seventh anniversary and are the proud parents of three children. And they owe it all to a miracle. We'll be right back. Coming up. Three-year-old Shosho Deng is dying of congenital heart disease, but he has an angel on his side, a woman who has brought him thousands of miles from his home in search of a miracle. When you hand over your child to that anesthesiologist and they take him through those swinging doors to go to the OR, and you don't know if you're ever gonna see your child alive again, it is, uh, it rips your insides. It's a story of East meets West, which proves angels know no boundaries. When It's a Miracle continues. One of the newest technologies to enter our lives is the internet. It's turned our computers into a source of quick and easy information that no one would have dreamed possible. Today, we can sit in the comfort of our own home and do everything from buying books to paying bills to saving the life of a child thousands of miles away. Yes, that's exactly what happens in our next story, when the World Wide Web lives up to its name in a most miraculous way. In 1997, Yanshin Deng left his wife and son in China to complete his doctorate at the University of Western Australia in Perth. But as often as possible, he called home to check on his family. I did not expect anything bad. I just asked her, how is our son? She cried and she told me, our son was diagnosed as uh, congenital heart defects. The doctor told my wife he's not curable. It was very hard for me to accept that. Before that, I always thought he was a normal child. With nowhere to turn, Yonshin searched the internet hoping to find information on congenital heart defects and perhaps someone who could save his child's life. But I did not have any money, so I just tried to contact any charitable organizations I could find. I just sent out about 500 emails to the organizations and hospitals and, you know, doctors. His message ended with a heartfelt plea from a father facing the loss of his only child. I told them he has very serious congenital heart defects, but he's very beautifully alive, and I believe he deserves your help. Halfway around the world in Pendleton, Oregon, Yanshin's message appeared on Mary Ann Whalen's computer screen. The letter said, to all the kind people of the world, please help me save my son. And I read it, and immediately, my heart just went boing. And I knew how he felt because my son was sick. I emailed him immediately and told him that I would do whatever I could to help him. Marianne began contacting names on the PD Heart List, an internet support group for parents of children with congenital heart disease. I wrote that the world is too rich to let this child die without a fight. Her message caught the attention of Dr. Juan Alejos, a pediatric cardiologist at UCLA's Children's Hospital. I emailed Miriam back and I told her that I was very concerned that based on the information I had, I thought that his chances of survival were very slim. And for me to make a, a, an accurate assessment that I would need to see Shosho do my own ultrasound 
and potentially do the heart catheterization to measure pressures in his heart. As soon as Dr. Alejos gave us the thumbs up, I emailed Young Sin with the great grand news and he was very excited. I was very happy. I saw real hope then. If only I can get my son to a good hospital, he will not be, you know, untreatable. Yanqin gave up his studies to return to China and obtain U.S. visas for himself and his family. Meanwhile, Mary Ann began searching the PD heart list for someone in Los Angeles willing to host the Deng family during their stay. Brenda Isaacs Booth discovered the message on the internet and was immediately struck by similarities between Shosho's condition and her own one and a half year old son, Liam. The fact that we had been told the same thing, that Liam was inoperable, nothing could be done, and then to read it from somebody else definitely was a huge motivating factor. I kept thinking over and over, what if they were told the same thing that we were told and it's not true. This child is really operable. Something can be done to help him, but they just need another opinion. And I thought, well, how could I say no? My child's surgeries were at the same hospital. I know all the surgeons and the cardiologists there, so it just seemed um, fated for me to do this. Okay, Marianne, so is everything all set up for them to come? Arrangements were made for the Dengs tickets. to fly to the U.S. Okay, now, now how much does UCLA want? But there was still a major problem. Oh, wow. Okay, how much have we raised so far? $200? You've got to be kidding. And I thought, well, we're bringing them here, and we have no money to even pay for the testing. So I got on the phone and hit up everybody in my family for money. $5,000? And uh, one of my brothers said he was going to get $5,000. I just burst into tears. I was just sobbing, crying. I couldn't believe. No, I'm okay. That is so generous of you. I... Time was of essence to get this child help. Thank you so much. So I just started getting money from everyone in my family. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Then I was able to write them and say, guess what? I've got it. <laughs> I've got enough money from my family to make all this happen. On January 30th, 1998, Brenda finally met the Deng family face to face. Oh, they're here. Finally seeing them after several months of just emailing back and forth, it made it real that this was really happening. But it made it more emotional in the sense that I started really hoping, oh God, please let this work out because once you've met and you see each other's faces and you start interacting, it solidifies the relationship even more. Brenda, we have a gift for Liam. Thank you. That's very It was sweet. like this connection that we had had that just became so much stronger once we were in person because of the commonality we had of fighting for our children's lives. It just was a, a kind of excitement and joy. It's like that kind of excitement that you get when you're happy but scared. Five days later, Shosho was hospitalized for a series of tests conducted by Dr. Alejo's team. There was a lot of tension and a lot of stress because we knew that that heart cath was the determining test that was gonna tell us whether Shosho was operable or not. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Yes. Davis. Hi. Shosho. He's doing fine. Um, his pressure, it's, it's a little higher than we expected. Thing, what are we doing? The doctor told me that Shosho's pulmonary pressure was too high to have any surgeries. And I, mean, I think it was a pretty unanimous um, among the cardiologists and the surgeons that this risk was higher than, than normal. I went with the doctor to the hallway and I uh, asked him, please help my son, please do something to save him. And the doctor told me, not to do something might be better than to do something. It was extremely heartbreaking, but I told them that we were not done, that I would send Shosho's test to other doctors and other hospitals. We weren't just gonna give up with that one 
diagnosis. The emotional conclusion when it's a miracle continues. When he learned that his three-year-old son, Shosho, was suffering from congenital heart defects, Yon Shin Dang began an internet search that led him to two angels in America. And with the support of Marianne Wayland and Brendan Isaacs Booth, the Deng family was brought to the United States where Shosho was given a battery of tests. The results were not good. His pressure, it's, it's a little higher than we expected. But Brenda refused to give up. And when she accidentally ran into her son's surgeon in the hospital hallway, she approached him with her concerns. Dr. Lax, can I talk to you for just a second? Yes, hello, Brenda. Hi. You remember Shosho, the little boy I was telling you about? Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to look at his cath results and tell me honestly if anything at all can be done to help him? Why, certainly, Brenda. I'd be happy to do that. Yes? Well, they're right here, so I'll tell them. Okay. We get a phone call a week Thanks. to two weeks later. Dr. Lax thinks his surgery should be done and that he can do it. He says he's operable. And it was like, rejoice, hallelujah, this is wonderful. Some new hope came and we could not, you know, hold our happiness. This is what we've been waiting for. Unfortunately, the surgery was very expensive. And once again, finances became an issue. Brenda, how do we get the money? Look, I don't want you to worry about that. They kept saying, where are we going to get this money? I mean, where are we going to get this money? And I kept saying, you know what? I don't know where, but I'll get it. I will get it. I mean, this one is, is something that happened all through the internet and through email. So I... Brenda understood the power of the media, and so she spent hours trying to convince a reporter at a local paper to publish Shosho's story. When it finally hit the stands, a miraculous chain of events was set into motion. The other heart stories? I get a call the morning that this article comes out from somebody at NBC. Tom Brokaw saw it? Tom Brokaw wants to do a feature on really? it. And it was just like a snowball. Yeah, that, that, the Today that, Show right. did seven segments on Show Show. The NBC Nightly News did three segments. You're kidding me. And I get a call from NBC telling me that $50,000 has been donated. $50,000? I just started sobbing and crying and thanking them. We, we now got the money for his Within first a few surgery. days, donations from around the world had reached $100,000. Oh, I was just so shocked. I did not think it would come so quickly. On April 14th, 1998, Shosho was prepped for surgery. When you hand over your child to that anesthesiologist, and they take him through those swinging doors to go to the OR, and you don't know if you're ever gonna see your child alive again. It is, uh, it rips your insides. I would say I never cried so much in my life. We were scared, but we did not know if we could come out of that operation room alive or not. It was extremely, extremely emotional and uh, scary. Very much so. Several hours later, Dr. Lax gave the Dengs the news they'd been praying for. Well, I think I can safely say that everything has turned out very well. I told them that the pressure had come down better than we had expected with very good oxygenation. And so they were very sincerely happy that things had turned out well at that point. That was the best news we have ever heard. That Shosho was not hopeless. <laughs> I remember Yung Shin looked at me and said, Thank you, Brenda. You saved my child's life. And it was a lot of people that did that. You know, it, it, it took a lot of people to donate the money, and Marianne's helped to get him over here, and my family's helped to get the testing. So it definitely wasn't just me, but it, uh, it was a feeling like I've never had before of gratification and uh, it made you feel very small in a very big world. Today, Shosho is an active five-year-old. Shosho is doing very well now. 
he's had open heart surgery, but he plays around just like a normal child. He's a happy boy. He's uh, Liam's best friend, and Liam is his best friend too. They play together all the time. He's a miracle child. I mean, here's a child who was given no chance to live and no chance of surgery, and he defied all the odds. He came halfway across the world and found, found life again. I would say Brenda is really an angel to Shosho. We are extremely grateful to Brenda. I would tell everybody, offered donations, offered information, offered services, or any kind of help to Shosho. I would say to them, we are so grateful to you. You saved Shosho's life. In preparing this story, we learned that congenital heart defects are the most common birth defects, but they're also the least publicized. So we've invited Brenda and the Deng family to join us and share some more information. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hi, Hi Richard. First of all, how's Shosho doing? Shosho is doing very well. He recovered right you know, after surgery. He recovered out of five days. So after that, he keeps active. He's happy, you know, he's stronger. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Brenda, I know that this experience has changed your life, and I hear that you have your own foundation now. Yes, basically what I did was, after bringing Show Show over and uh, the success that we had with that, I started a fund called Little Hearts on the Mend under the umbrella of the Heart of a Child Foundation. And it's a nonprofit, and our goal is to help pay for children's heart surgeries, for children whose families cannot afford them. So um, I've brought since another little girl from China, and she's also doing very well, and hopefully we'll be able to help a lot of children get the surgeries that they really, really need. That's terrific. And we have a website. I have a, a website. Uh, you can find us at www.littleheartsonthemend.org. And I have websites for Show Show. I have kind of a diary of everything he's been through, and I have pictures of he and Liam. and. It's been really neat. I have people from all over the world who visit his site and send me wonderful letters, and it's been really great. Well, after this, I'm sure you'll be getting a lot more messages from our viewers, and I know that they'll be thanking you for sharing your story with us. Take care, everybody. Bye, Richard. Thank you, bye. <laughs> we'll be right back in a moment. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us. And a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. <laughs>